Okay, so now we finally start with the first um, core continuum mechanics topic, which is kinetics. And I am sorry, that should have been kinematics. Kinetics comes next. Okay, so kinematics, what it means is analysis of motion and deformation. And after this, we will encounter kinetics, which is going to be analysis of forces and equilibrium. Um, so now, again, maybe let me repeat once again, I'm trying to keep the concepts to the minimum necessary. Okay? And just once in a while, I flex that requirement on, 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 on the content of this course. Uh, and these are requirements that I've set so that people from different backgrounds could find things that are useful um, and uh, still not get lost in too much detail that is irrelevant to them. Okay? So, so I try to keep things to a minimum. And as I do that, unfortunately, I do have to sacrifice once in a while from, uh, um, due to the structure from concepts that are actually quite important. And one of these concepts is the concept of an observer that will be on the background of everything that we do. So let me very briefly um, just uh, talk about an observer uh, in a, let me say, a continuum mechanics course just that, are, that is geared just for, let's say, solid mechanicians. Uh, this is certainly something that I will talk about in a little bit more detail. But really the question is very, uh, the, the concept is very simple. And here, I go back to a remark I made earlier. When we were talking about a basis change or vector rotation of a vector, I, made a dis I distinguished change in interpretation, change of basis, and change in the perceived physics, okay? the physics as we perceive it. Okay? And that is, was the rotation, right? Now, the question is, how do we interpret something, a physical event that is going on? And when I talk about some physical event, who? Is it observed with respect to who is reporting that event? And really, uh, the question, let me make it even simpler and ask you, is this object moving? It's not moving. But for you, for somebody on the moon, it is moving because the Earth, okay, or for somebody on the sun, if you could do that, or for a spaceship, whatever, that object is moving because the Earth is rotating or whatever, and it's moving, right? So when you say it doesn't move, it's with respect to you. And similarly, if the object is rotating and I decide to, to rotate with the object, then the object is not rotating with respect to me. Uh, but actually, there is some rotation. There is some inertial radial acceleration, whatever, involved with that. And capturing or understanding exactly what is happening to this object in reality, quote unquote, is very important because when you write laws, right, suppose I have a rope and it's rotating about some axis and at the tip of the rod uh, or the rod there is a, uh, I'm sorry, rope or the rod there is a ball, so I'm swing the, the swinging this rope. And of course, I know that there's a tension in this rope due to the radial component of the acceleration, which you can easily calculate after your first dynamics course, right? But now if you take an observer that sits on the rope and somehow rotates with it, it doesn't see the object as rotating. And hence, if you don't really inform this person about some x or some motion, about his absolute motion with respect to some other stationary person, then this person will not be able to correctly state the physical event, he won't be able to correctly interpret it because he will predict that there is no tension in that rope, right? So you have to somehow have a, well, first of all, every one of you is an observer, but that's not enough. In order to state physical laws correctly, I have to have, in essence, some frame of reference, some observer whom I know knows the exact statement of some physical laws, and if I move, rotate, etc., with respect to such a person, an observer, then I can do a relative, 
let me say, translation of my, my motion with respect to that person, and then interpret my event correctly. So in this case, it would mean that I'm sitting on the rope and I'm rotating with the rope, right? Um, and to me, the object is not rotating, but I know due to the reporter from the outside that I myself am rotating. And then I would add that additional term as, let's say, what you would call a Coriolis acceleration. And then I would eventually calculate things correctly. Right? So now, in the old times, uh, so, so let me write down here a question. How do we know, let's say, whether the object is rotating or us, right? For that matter, the object may not be actually rotating. We might be rotating and thinking that the object is rotating. So in the old times, uh, people, well, there's always, first of all, the concept of an observer. In the few times that it will appear, I will indicate it with a omega. And after a while, I will drop it, the capital omega. Sometimes this is called a frame of reference. Um, and in the old times, in some texts, you see that one defines a frame of reference with respect to fixed stars. OK? You know, so who is moving? Uh, in order to decide that, I need to know that there is something that actually absolutely does not move, fixed star. So you see a phrase like this. So an observer with respect to fixed star. And the observer moves like this. With respect to what? With respect to fixed stars. Well, how about the stars? Are they moving? No, they're fixed. Okay? So, so it's, it's like something that dissolves this dilemma. And so now you know absolutely how you yourself are moving. Okay? And now you can go ahead and interpret the physics correctly. That's the concept of an observer. Okay? Um, and if you have an interpretation with respect to one observer, sometimes you'd like to restate that with respect to an other observer, and so on. That would be a change of frame of reference or change of observer, et cetera. All of these concepts are things that need to be carefully developed. They have important applications in the statement of continuum mechanics, the physical laws, and uh, several other things. There practical applications like symmetries, um, implications of material symmetry, some of which we are going to discuss. But now, I've said this once. And from now on, when I write an observ observer, uh, you at least know that on the back of your minds, we are interpreting something with respect to some probably special choice of an observer. And the choice of the observer does matter. Now, having said that much, now we forget it. Okay? We sweep this mess onto a rock and just continue. Okay? And I'd like to continue with the first uh, concept of kinematics, which is configuration and motion. And um, we are going to draw a set of diagrams that, that, that is very uh, common in continuum mechanics. So essentially, I'm going to draw three sort of sets. And I will give these names. That's um, calligraphic B, B for body. This is going to be called R0. So this is not really a physical domain. I will talk about it. This is a physical domain. So in this, in this sense, it's like the, in the integral theorems, we had a domain D. That would be a domain R0 in this case. Um, and this would be another domain. Uh, let's call that R. Um, R0 for reference configuration. And this is the 
um, current configuration. And there are, there are a number of other names. This is current or spatial configuration. And let me add, actually, a number of other re remarks here. Um, and then I will clarify them as I talk about them. So sometimes it's called the initial or undeformed as well. Initial meaning at time equals 0. Undeformed meaning it's stress-free. Okay. And sometimes this is also called the deformed configuration. In fact, I just decided that perhaps it's best that I complete this picture first. Okay. And then I talk about um, every quantity in detail. OK, so um, this picture means the following. So first of all, eventually we would like to analyze an object. Okay? I'm going to take an object. I'm going to apply forces and whatever to it. And this object, as a result of those forces, will move, accelerate, rotate, deform, etc. That's my purpose. So I have an object. And this object, of course, is composed of some Particles. Now, those particles, depending on the, on the, on the, on the uh, level of detail you want to look at, could be, I don't know, small pieces of, let's say, um, particles embedded in a matrix for a composite, or it could be molecules, or let's say they are nuclei. 
with electron clouds or whatever around it. Okay? So if I'd like to talk about this object, a simple way to talk about it would be to identify the object as a collection of those particles, say nuclei. And I have so many particles, and every particle has a label. I know precisely the names of every particle, just like you in this class. And I identify this class as a list of particles, if you like, as a set of you guys, right? And for me now, you have a class. But really, you have no shape. You have no uh, distribution in space, particular seating. In other words, the object doesn't really have any particular shape in my mind. I just think of the object as a set, a collection of particles. That is what we call a body. A body, a collection of particles, and each particle has a label M. Now, this body uh, eventually, however, in time, due to the application of forces, let's say there are forces, it will move and deform, as I said. So every one of those particles will change its position and its proximity to neighboring particles, etc., due to deformation with time. So everything depends on time. But this is just a collection of particles. It's just in my mind. It's not anywhere. It's just a list. Okay? And for every particle in my list, for a given time, I know where its position is. Suppose I have such a function. This is such a function. A function is a vectorial function of a strange quantity. It's just a label in this case. It's not a vector. It's just a label. It's a name. Okay? Particle m at a given time t is at a particular position. And that position will be called x, small x. Okay? So if I keep the particle fixed, I track the same particle, and I make time change, this particle will move to a different position. It will flow, let's say, right? And, and therefore, this thing, for a given particle, will track the particle. It will depend on time. At any given time, this particle happens to be at a point in the Euclidean vector space. That point is p. So at this given time, at p, there is one particle. But just a little bit time later, that particle will move on to another point in the Euclidean space. The point itself really remains there. And if this vector is not particularly tracking that particle, this is just a vector that points to that point in the Euclidean vector space. The particle happens to be passing through x, but x points to that point in the Euclidean vector space. If you want to track the particle, you have to keep m fixed and make t evolve. In other words, this is the vector that this, this, this function is the thing that tracks the particle. With time changing, chi t will give you new and new values for x. OK? All right. So now, uh, however, now eventually, if you like to talk about motion, deformation, and eventually, if you like to do calculations, it turns out it's very cumbersome to keep track of the shape of the object and its motion in terms of name uh, labels of particles. Instead, we do something clever. Okay? And what we do is, instead of working with an abstract object, a body, a list of particles only, I take a reference so-called configuration. Now, Right? As I said, every particle will have a particular position at time t. Now, if I make this map in my list of particles for every particle, every particle will occupy a point in the Euclidean vector space. And now I perceive the object. I know where it is. I know its shape. I know with time how this object will move. Okay? At any given instant, the domain and together with its shape and everything, is called a configuration. Because this configuration changes with time, when I take a snapshot, this is the current configuration. Okay? Because a little bit time later, it's going to change. A little bit time before, it was different. The current one is this. Okay? Sometimes it's called spatial. It's just a choice of uh, wording. And now, notice there's yet an alternative one. And that brings me now to the concept that it's hard to keep track of the motion of the object with labels. Instead, what I do is I choose a given time, a reference time. It doesn't have to be time equals 0, but let's pick it that way. At time equals 0, before I start my watch, I'm going to associate every one of these particles. I'm going to look at where the object is. Okay? Particle A is there, B is there, C is there, M is there. And that's before anything happens to the object. That's where the object is. It's not, it hasn't deformed. It hasn't moved. 
This is what I will call the reference configuration. And because I'm going to also assume it doesn't have to be this way, I'm going to assume it's undeformed. That's the typical wording as well, undeformed configuration. And for stresses, for flues, really doesn't make sense. But for uh, solids, sorry, it's also called a um, stress-free configuration. Okay? Uh, the reference configuration is just a configuration that you cook up so that now you can say, I want to talk about a particular particle. I'm not going to refer to it with its label M. I'm going to refer to it with, to it with the position that it happens to occupy at the reference time, and that is capital X. Okay? So now, therefore, for a given label of the particle, at time equals zero, I have a map that, and this is also vectorial, that sends me a particular point in the Euclidean vector, vector space. This is also a referential point, P naught in this case. That point has a reference uh, a vector, capital X. So now, if I'd like to track the motion of the particle, now I have an art alternative, and this is yet another map. I'd like to track how the particle that happens to occupy position capital X at time equals zero moves with time. And now, I pick a particle, that means I pick a particular position that it was at. At any given point, there can be only one particle, one nucleus, let's say. And therefore, there is a unique relation between this and M. And now with time changing, of course, it's the same particle, like this one, same particle, but time changes, the particle will move, and the configuration will evolve with time. Okay? So now, this is just abstract, but this, if you like, it's physical. This is the undeformed or stress-free or initial configuration of the object, and now I apply forces to it. This will deform, it will move, rotate, etc., and at any given time it will fill a particular geometry, which is the configuration. All right. Now, um, let me write down immediately uh, before I forget some of the things that I've said. So the body is just an abstract object. And it's a collection of material points, M. Okay? So just let's call them particles. Um, we identified every particle, or we label them. Capital X or small x. Capital X, it's a map, and this is the letter chi, by the way, so chi naught in terms of the label of the particle, or uh, I could have chi of t in terms of the label of the particle. Small x and large x, they are the so-called position vectors, position of that particle, of that particle we're talking about. And, um, P and P naught are just <laughs> points in our Euclidean vector space, or point space. And this map has a particular name. It's called the motion map. A map is just another name for a function. It takes as its argument the referential, the position of a particle at the reference configuration for a given time. It tells you what the new position of the particle is. So when we talk about motion and deformation, we primarily refer to this function, chi of t because it's practical. This also has 
embodies all the information about motion and deformation, but it's not very practical. This is directly in terms of some reference position vector. It's a little bit more useful. Okay, so that's x is equal to chi of t of um, capital X. And this gives us the path um, of a particle. Okay. The path that it passes through in space. So in the diagrams that I will eventually draw uh, from now on, I think without exception, maybe just one, once more I might draw this to remind you, but I will skip this part. And from now on, we're only going to see the reference and the current because the reference embodies all of this information. The purpose is to introduce something that we can observe and easily uh, constitutes a reference for us when we do our calculations and when we do our statements. And uh, the need for such a configuration naturally arises, by the way, when you do the numerics as well. Um, but nevertheless, um, let me on the side, right, without going into detail, again, just, just mention that the reference configuration actually, okay, the reference configuration does not have to be the initial one. It does not have to be undeformed, and therefore it does not have to be stress-free, okay? And actually, it doesn't need to be physical, and such a reference configuration naturally exists uh, in, for instance, numerical methods like finite elements, uh, when you talk about so-called master elements. The reference configuration does not have to even, if you like, be a continuous domain. It can be defined piecewise for portions of the domain, and every domain can have its own tiny reference configuration, and so on. But really, again, I go back, think simple. For us, this is just the initial configuration of the object. And now we want to apply forces, and it will deform. Referential position, spatial position vector. And those are the quantities that are going to appear a lot. That's the spatial position. OK, so uh, now, of course, uh, as soon as you know how every particle moves and where it is at any given time, now you can immediately start taking derivatives. And one of the fundamental derivatives, naturally, is associated with the velocity and acceleration. So we're going to take derivatives with respect to time. So uh, V would be the derivative of the motion with respect to time for a given particle. I'm going to write it in several ways. Um, when I write it like this, it implicitly also defines what I understand from a velocity vector. It's taking the derivative of the motion map while tracking the particle. It's a partial because to indicate that I am keeping the particle fixed. It's for the same particle, not switching particles. Okay? So a partial derivative with respect to time, that's what I understand from velocity. And likewise, for an acceleration uh, vector, I would understand that there is a velocity vector. The velocity vector at any given, well, the velocity vector is a field. For different particles, it's different, right? For different particles, it's different. And for a given particle, it could change with time. So it's a function of the particle and time. What I understand, again, I keep the particle fixed. And that is my definition of an acceleration, right? And so now that's a vector field m and t. And that is a vector field a, m, and t. Okay, those are the. Uh, first, fundamental derivatives that we could immediately go ahead and calculate. 
Uh, now, let me dwell a little bit more after making that remark. And we're going to come back to these representations of functions in terms of labels and time. Um, let me go back to the position vectors. Okay? So as you've already noticed, there is a natural need to distinguish between these two position vectors. I cannot call everything small x because small x points to a particular point in the Euclidean vector space. At a given time, there is a certain particle there. A little bit time later, there is going to be a different particle there. So this is not a unique relation between a particle and a position. This, however, is. When I talk about x, it does not depend on time. Okay? This configuration is time independent. It's defined once. I have a unique relation for every position vector and the uh, particle. Okay? So to make that clear and to track that relation, uh, so for clarity and also for precision, we want to distinguish also between basis sets. And from now on, um, eventually I'd like to take gradients with respect to one or the other configuration. And so that you understand clearly what I'm taking derivatives with respect to, whenever I refer to the referential position vector, I'm going to indicate its components with capital indices. Okay? And the basis will be capital EA. Okay? Um, and for a spatial vector, I'm going to write xi, ei. The reason is practical. When I, if I did not make this, uh, right, uh, if I didn't, didn't pick a different notation for the indices, if I call this, let's say, xj, ej, whatever, if I write some quantity comma i, how do you know it's whether with respect to the spatial or the reference configuration? Now I distinguish between something comma i and something comma a. When you say a, you immediately understand that I'm talking about derivatives with respect to the referential position vector. That's why it's important to do this. And as soon as I do that, I want to also attach a different basis so you understand which basis I'm also talking about. Because remember, here I cannot write e a. It doesn't make sense. It's not practical. It's not, it defeats my goal because eventually A will have a number, 1, 2, or 3. As soon as I write 1 here, you now forgot your memory of which one it belonged to. So, but if you see this, you know it belongs to capital X. Okay? So very practical. Okay? Not only practical, but it will also help us avoid making errors. And you're going to see how that comes about. Okay? So it's important that we do this. And in fact, Whenever I see a quantity that we will from now on say lives in the reference configuration, or I'll say associated with the reference configuration, it's going to have an index that's capital. And if it lives in the current configuration, uh, then I'm going to attach to it a uh, small index, okay, lowercase. Uh, we're going to do similar for operators. Okay. And as I said, when possible, I am going to drop the bracket. And what I mean right here, I'm not writing the brackets. It's clear gradient of a vector. When I say similar for operators, there is a capital and a lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, also for the gradient. Because I mean two different things with these gradient operators. For this one, I mean del v with respect to a position. Which one? Capital one. And this one is small. This is also one reason why, instead of a usual nabla sign, I prefer just writing, in this course at least, uh, in words, grat, or div for that matter. Okay, so this is going to be del vi over del xa in components. Now, be careful. First comes the basis of the upper one. Then you attach the basis of the lower one. And that's a capital EA. Okay? And this is vi del xj ei bon ej. And I would do something similar for divergence. Okay? And I would do something similar for curl. Because in every one of those, there is a 
partial derivative with respect to position. Which one? Capital always reference, lowercase always spatial. Okay? So now that's what we understand from notation. So here I've said, well, I have something. It has a basis, uh, capital E, and therefore it lives in, lives in R0 or lives in R. And so then the same sort of argument, of course, carries over to tensors as well. So when I look here, I see all lowercase indices corresponding lowercase letters for the basis. And therefore I can say, well, this tensor lives in the spatial configuration. Okay? That's what I could say. Okay. How about that one? Right? So now this is another example to a particular, right? Once in a while I mentioned tensors on the two sides of the bond. I said I can have different vectors and I gave you some examples. This is yet another example, right? So this quantity lives neither completely in the reference nor in the spatial current configuration. It has, one can say, because it's second order, one leg in the reference, one leg in the current. Okay? Uh, so that's a different type of tensor. We're going to see more tensors of that form. Okay? So not everything lives entirely in one configuration. Uh, and in fact, such tensors have the, let me say, um, in some sense, the uh, task of taking an object from the reference and mapping it to the current configuration. That's why it has legs on both sides. It needs to be able to operate on both. OK. Um, okay. So this is the notation. And this is our famous picture with continuum potatoes or really ab objects, abstracts, just some lines that indicate actually physically an object. OK. So could be a car, airplane, could be you, could be a piece of you like your liver. Doesn't matter. Okay? What matters is just something that we can eventually analyze under the action of forces. It will move and deform. That's what matters for us. Okay? Questions? <laughs> 